Come on. Quick ask before we get started today, I am working to help people lead happier and more contented lives. My part of that is money. So if you enjoyed today's episode or if you've enjoyed past episodes, please take a minute and leave a quick review on iTunes. Subscribe. That helps uh, the show climb up the rankings and helps more people uh, find it. So thanks a lot. Judy, are you ready? I am so ready. Well, I'm ready. The people are ready. Let's go. Welcome to Money Savage Engage. This is George Grumbacher. Judy Ryan is the CEO of LifeWork Systems, a culture transformation specialist, a consultant, a trainer, an author, and a columnist. Her purpose is to create a world in which all people love their lives. I'm excited to have you on. Judy, tell us a little bit about your personal life, some more about your work, and why you do what you do. Thank you so much, George. I'm really happy to be on here, and I appreciate your questions very much. Um, I am a mother of five millennial children. I'm a grandmother of eight grandchildren, and oh, wow. I'm very, very passionate about this work that I'm doing. Um, well, I'll tell you a little bit about myself in terms of this work. I was introduced to a psychology model that some people who have studied psychology might remember hearing about, but he just didn't get very much press. And his name was Alfred Adler. And his work really changed my life very profoundly, first in raising my family in a very unconventional way and really healing some things that had happened to me that really happened to everybody, even under the most typical conditioning that people have today. So this his work has really helped me to become this strong, clear-sighted, contributing person that I feel proud of. And um, I recently read a book about him called The Courage to be Disliked. And it was written by these two Japanese authors. And they said in the introduction that Adler's at least 100 years of his t- ahead of himself. And I've been saying that since the 80s when I learned about his work. So hmm. um, he it's because his psychology model is very counter to what we think of as the power games that continue to be really popular today. So um, that's why I love his work is it's really crucial to creating a healthy community of people compared to an unhealthy one and um, how we use power. And that's something that probably a lot of people would rather just kind of keep on the down low because they like the way they can use power now. So um, do you want me to tell you a little bit more about that, George? Yeah, yeah, I'm definitely interested in what you mean by, by that contrary to the power games. Yeah. So Adler is the person who coined the phrase inferiority complex. Okay. So today, a lot of people know Brene Brown. Do you know Brene Brown? I do. Okay. So she's an international celebrity now, author, researcher, and everything. And her work is on shame and vulnerability. Well, Adler's work has always been on that too. He said something to the effect that if we don't get the conversations and the conditions right, wherever people are gathered, even if it's in their homes or in their schools or in their workplaces, the natural result will be that people enter into inferiority complex. (laughs) And when they do, they start to have these very uh, diagnosable symptoms of internal and external struggles. So things like being addicted, depressed, you know, having anxiety, having obesity, and all these kinds of internal struggles people go through. And then the external struggles are things like all of the isms that people are experiencing, all the win-lose dynamics. I'm right, you're wrong. Let me convert you and fix you and change you. And um, those are all coming from the conditions that create those inferiority feelings. So even Brene Brown, when she goes and does talks, large corporations, large organizations will say, Brene, we just love you, but let's not really talk about that shame stuff. It's just a little too dark and it makes people a little too uncomfortable. But what Adler and Brene Brown are both saying, because she said it's her number one platform, is that if we could do this part differently, we'd have a completely different world. And that's been my experience, is that if we could learn how to create a certain set of conditions that we are not commonly creating, people would be very different with one another. And it's just kind of hard for people to recognize it because all they really know succinctly most of the time is co- like uh, power over, power under sort of dynamics. So in a um, uh, Adlerian model, in a Teal organizational model, which is the model that we use and that we've built, it's all about shared power, It's all about celebrating power, guiding power, even from 
whatever age or title anybody has. So for example, when I was growing up, or I mean, when my kids were growing up, we did family meetings and we shared the rotation of the management of those meetings. And one time we were invited to demonstrate a family meeting in front of a large audience of parents and teachers. And we had the five-year-old run the meeting. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, they were so surprised because she knew how to hold the authority. She knew how to delegate. She knew how, how to manage the process. She knew how to, you know, end on time, all those things. And what happened afterwards was the audience had all these questions for the kids because I had at that time they were four of the five. And um, they could confidently talk about the way that they came to conclusions when we problem solved as a family. And I said to the audience, you all probably are sh you know, really shocked or surprised that a five-year-old has that much leadership capability, but what you don't know is how hard it was for me to learn to be a good follower of a five-year-old, because mm -hmm. I'm a pretty dominant mother, and I wanted to steamroll her a lot of the time. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to learn how to encourage and support and and um, be patient with a with a five-year-old leader and and that's kind of what I see is missing in the world today is people don't know how to lead and follow with agility either they think of themselves as a leader or as a follower but not both and and that's part of the reason we can't keep up with things well today it's just something as basic as leader follower agility and then we also uh, we did a lot of things to actively promote something that I'll be talking about, I'm sure, more than once, but uh, four core needs that all people need to feel. So we would remove everything from the family that would make our kids feel uh, the opposite of this, empowered, lovable, connected, and contributing. And so we would be, we would, in order for them to feel empowered, lovable, connected, and contributing, we were constantly teaching them task ownership, which meant how to do things they were capable of doing as soon as they were capable of doing it managing relationships, managing the budget at the grocery store, managing the grocery shopping. We would teach them how to do it and drop them off as a group. And they would get to the checkout and the lady, you know, the oldest was 11 and she'd say, where are your parents? You have hundreds of dollars. Oh, we know what we're doing. She's got the list. He's right. got the, computer, you know. So we really uh, practiced all of what we learned from Adler in our, our uh, family, which really created an incredible outcome of leader follower agility and intrinsic motivation and emotional intelligence, those sorts of things. Well, I love it. And you're speaking my, well, not technically speaking my language, because these are a lot of terms that I'm not, that I'm not familiar <laughs> with, but but the but the the ideas and the principles that you're talking about, I, I think are so, so important. So why are many of them absent from our culture today? You know, I think part of it is that power the way we know it seems so powerful like for example if i held a gun to your head george and said mm -hmm. you know empty your pockets and you thought i'd use the gun on you it would look like it's very effective right yes most, most times it would if i also said look i'll give you a thousand dollars if you do something the way i want you to do it if it's not outrageous to you you probably would do it so using the control models that we've used i've just named two of them uh fear tactics power over autocratic command and control that's all one of those uh the other one is using a dangling a carrot those are control models there's two other ones one is if I say, George, I'm so proud of you, or George, I'm so disappointed in you. I could be very much able to, at times with certain people, manipulate behavior pretty quickly with those things. Another one would be to spoil and pamper you and enable you uh, in an effort to get you to be a good citizen. So we're so used to doing those things, we don't even recognize that they are the problem. And so that's why people, so it's almost like the difference between, well, I can just pop some candy in my mouth and I can have a sugar high versus like right now I'm on ketogenic and I feel a totally different kind of energy than a sugar high. But it, it is a, a complete transformation to be a fat burning person versus a carb burning person. And one has a lot greater health benefits. So the same is true around culture. It may look more powerful to threaten people or give them a dirty look or, you know, throw a reward out, but it is not um, the answer. Got it. Well, and that certainly makes sense. So it's just a matter of this is what we've been conditioned to do. This is the way things have been done mm -hmm. for a long time and moving outside of, for lack of a better term, the, the, that, that, that box 
puts you at risk of being disliked? And- yeah. So, yeah, I think we are kind of insane in what we're doing. Here's a story that will sort of illustrate that. There is a prison in Florida that used an Adlerian approach, meaning used Adler psychology. And the typical rate of recidivism, which means repeat reincarceration. So typically when a person is incarcerated, they go into a cycle of crime. <clears throat> they don't just do it once, they do it over and over. That rate is normally about 60 to 70% nationwide, which ironically is what our disengagement rates are according to the Gallup organization hmm. in, in our, our entire uh, work communities. So when they used an Adlerian approach, the, the recidivism rate went down to 4%. Wow. I've seen similar results in the work that I'm doing with companies, but it's not for the faint of heart. <clears throat> it requires a lot of courage. It requires a lot of dismantling. Um, and one of my favorite quotes is by a man who wrote a book called The Half-Life of Facts, Why Everything We Know Has an Expiration Date. And that's a book uh, written by Sam Arbusman. And he said this about change blindness. He said, we have a problem with it right now in the world of facts and knowledge. He said, sometimes we're exposed to these new facts. Like you could be exposed to the Teal organizational model and we'll, we'll sometimes just filter it out because there's been a lot of information on different psychological organizational models. But really the problem is that we have to go out of our way to learn something new. So like for me to learn a ketogenic diet was very new. It's very different. It's not comfortable. So to learn something new, we have to go out of our way. And our blindness is not a failure to see the new facts. It's a failure to see the facts in our minds have uh, the potential to be out of date. So what I see in some of the more conventional leadership mindset is, oh my gosh, I don't want to look over here at this new thing because now I'm irrelevant. Now my, uh, my strengths are irrelevant. I'm out of date. And so that fear of being irrelevant keeps people from actually looking where it's time to change something. It's really kind of crazy when you think about it because none of us are ashamed if we upgrade our phones, but we're ashamed if we upgrade the way we see our human systems. And it should be just as natural to say, oh my gosh, we have this new thing that we are really seeing is more effective. So, you know, for me, the hardest thing about my work is spitting in the soup of what people are used to and telling them that it's no longer helpful to them. Right. And that's such a, it's such an interesting thing. Um, You, you you talk about, or you talk about having the courage to be disliked. And one of my favorite authors is Seth Godin. He talks about um, needing to be a meaningful specific work versus being a, um, a, wandering generality and talking about how you're not for all people. And I just couldn't agree with that more. Um, and it's actually for me, as I'm going out and about and trying to find organizations to work with for, for, for what I do, I want to try to find out who, who the no's are sooner rather than later and just move on to the next ones. Mm-hmm. Are, are, are there certain size organizations? Cause a, a, as you were talking, I was thinking that the, a, a middle manager type is probably the last person you would ever want to talk to because they probably wouldn't want to take a risk. So is a company too big or is, is, is a company too small? Um, I actually don't find that it's about the size of the company. It's really about a psychographic. Uh, I see the people that are best able to transition over to a teal organizational model are people that have a strong, positive, healthy ego. A strong ego is somebody who is not threatened by creating other leaders, is not created by um, complete equality. And so that could be somebody at a mid-level, it could be somebody at the front line. That makes it sense. Could be a senior. Now, of course, the people in the senior positions are the best one to have bought in. <clears throat> and I know, um, I know we've worked with companies that were very large where we worked with subsets of the companies, even in the, through the C-suite. But they were nervous about keeping their projects on down low because their their other senior leaders were leading by intimidation is what I call it, you know, and they kind of begrudgingly came around and said, well, you know, we're 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 shifting everything around again. If you need to, you can call that life work systems company because they can see the numbers. They can see how well it's going in there. 
but it's not the way they lead. And so um, it's just very interesting. It's, it's the most ideal when you get the CEO on board with a transformation process like this, but it doesn't mean it can't be done in other, you know, we, we find our best entry point is often operations people because they're the ones that are seeing all the facets of the business mm -hmm. and how well it's doing overall. I guess that certainly makes sense. So you mentioned the four core needs that, that, that everybody needs to, needs to have met. Yeah. Can we talk about those? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> Adler said that we're social. We need this to, in order not to feel inferior, we need to have this sense of belonging and significance in a way that <clears throat> we experience it on a feeling level. And so the feelings that we all need to feel are number one, and, and these aren't in any order. I'm just naming them this sure. way. Uh, the first is we need to feel empowered. <clears throat> like how empowered was it that my kids could lead a family meeting? How empowered was it that they could help make big decisions and small decisions? How empowering that they could learn to go do something that <clears throat> most kids their age weren't even allowed to do or weren't even thought to be able to do. So <clears throat> that's one example. Another one is people need to feel lovable. And this is a really important distinction to me personally because I was raised in a family that would be considered a very ideal family. I was not sexually abused. I was not physically abused. My family outwardly, affectionately loved and supported and took care of me. And I learned a lot of really good things from my family. One thing they were not good at, and I didn't understand it, and it made me feel guilty in my 20s when I struggled with anxiety and depression, because I thought, what do you have to be anxious and depressed about? You know, you had a really, really great childhood. Sure. <clears throat> but what they didn't know how to do that Adler helped me understand is they didn't know how to learn from a child, for example. Like there was no reciprocal thinking process. It was, oh no, you will be Catholic. You will be a, a very conservative, uh, you know, Republican. You will, if I, if I would disagree with my family, they would very politely tell me how I was wrong and convert me. Like that was just the standard thing. And I think it was very common in the 60s when I was being raised. And they didn't know how to empathize. So if you were a very emotional child or a sensitive child, you just didn't know how to even be heard or seen that way. And I think that's what's happening intergenerationally, but also between all different kind of different people is this inability to be more receptive to each other. Like if you look on even social media, the big the biggest thing that you see that's so distressing is I'm right, you're wrong. Oh, for sure. Right? Not tell me more about that. I'd like to understand how you came to that. Thank you for sharing that with me. <laughs> no you time know, for that, an Judy. Agenda and um, and really meaning it. Right. So so that feeling lovable is not being loved. It's feeling seen and heard. I remember in my 20s, I went to a therapist and I said, why do I keep having this recurrent dream that I'm walking around my house and I'm all by myself? And he said, because intellectually and emotionally you are. Hmm. And it was that understanding of people needing to feel lovable. And it sounds simple, but it's, it's actually, it is simple. But if you have never made an intention to do it with people, you won't. And then another uh, core need is to feel connected. So we can all think about, you know, the kid who shoots up the school because they feel isolated, yeah. you know, that's the worst case scenario. But people need to feel that they are chosen and connected and part of and that they're just as important as everyone else and that there's high trust and all those things that go with connected in a healthy way. And then we also this one is very much overlooked, like the lovable one is, and it's giving people the opportunity to be contributing. So sometimes when I go to a, an organization and they say, what do you mean you're taking away our rewards? I remember when I was in a school one time and I told the, the school, stop rewarding parents for going to the PTA meetings. Like they'd say, we have to give them a steak dinner and all this stuff. I said, stop it. What you want to do is call them up and say, hey, would you bring a quote to open the meeting? Would you bring a report on such and such? Will you bring a bottle of soda? Like give them something, a way to contribute makes people feel good but we're all so uncomfortable receiving that we don't give people opportunities to contribute. And it really costs everybody that we don't, we're not aware of that. In fact, the people that most need to contribute are usually the ones that the least is expected of them. Isn't that the truth? Yeah. Well, those are, those are excellent. I think that certainly as I was listening, I was able to, to think about different examples in my life when, when, when I've seen, people not have that or when I have seen people have that um, and when you give people 
what they need in those areas, a lot of the time they do light up and, oh, and, they, they and, totally and, do. and I mean, they do if engage. You even look at that prison. I'll just give you an example of this, George. Think about the person that's in prison because they joined a gang. And one of the guidelines for the gang was that they had to go out and murder somebody. Right. You know, that happens, right? Sure. If that person joined that game because it was the first time they ever felt truly empowered, lovable, connected and contributing and they didn't think they could get it outside of the game, they'll override their conscience and their fear of imprisonment to get those core needs met. And so one of the things I believe that they did in that prison was they probably went to those inmates and said, look, you're no different than any, me or anyone else. You wanted to feel empowered, lovable, connected, and contributing just like I do. So take yourself out of the monster box. We're taking you out of the monster box. You don't need to you know, cross those wires. Let's find a better way to get those needs met for you. Like, let's help you find a better way to get those needs met. I think that is a big part of what was different because we're, we're that desperate for those needs and we don't know we are. I think that's right. Well, Judy, Savage Nation is ready for your difference-making tip. What do you have for them? Okay, so um, I have a couple things. I kept switching back and forth in my mind. (laughs) Um, One of them is uh, I really believe that knowledge is very powerful. I had a phone call the other day from a woman who was 104 years old, and she had read one of my articles, and she said it made a huge difference. I said, I can't wait to meet her. I've not met a person 104 years old. But what I would really encourage people to do is twofold. One is I would have them really look at their lives and say, where am I either creating these feelings in myself and others or diminishing these feelings in myself or others? And it's really those four core needs. Am I looking in the mirror in the morning and going, you're so beautiful. You are such a child of God. I'm so happy you're here. You're making such a difference. Or am I going, oh, my God, I see another wrinkle. Oh, my God, (laughs) okay, gained five pounds or whatever. You know, like we're really not conditioned to create these four core feelings in ourselves or other people. So you want to do kind of a twofold thing. How do I put things in my life that make me feel those and how do I remove things from my life that don't and for the, from the lives of those I care about? So that was a huge underlying reason I did this work with my family. It was like, oh, my God, that just makes sense. How can I do more of that? Um, the other one is just to get information, because the hardest thing that I have is to educate people on these other approaches. I mean, just like parenting or anything else, you can find all kinds of different approaches. This particular more equality minded, shared power, personally responsible models, they're not as well known. They're not as well supported. So I would just say um, one of the things that I would really recommend is if anybody's listening to this and they want to know more, we we collect a, a collection of industry articles on our website. And these are articles that are not written by me. There's a whole bunch of articles on there that are written by me, but these are written by like Forbes and Inc. and Deloitte. And those are really helpful to see what's going on in organizational cultures, but also these same things apply in families or in schools. And you could go in there and you could learn about what kind of culture helps with the intergenerational problems. What kind of culture is important for diversity and inclusion? What kind of culture is important for agile and for um, uh, you know today's rapid change in the world? And so if they go there, they can read what the industry giants are saying about all those topics all in one place on my website. So that would be a tip that I would give them because the more information you have, the more information you want. Um, That's what I experienced in my life. Well, I think that is great stuff. That definitely gets it. Come on. Come on. Judy, (laughs) Judy, thank you so much for coming on. Where can Savage Nation learn more about you? My website has a lot of stuff on it that people can read or download or watch or whatever, and it's uh, life worksystems.com so it's like life work systems.com and my email address is the same it's just judy at life work systems.com perfect well savage nation if you enjoyed this as much as i did show judy your appreciation and share today's show with a friend who also appreciates good ideas go to life work systems.com check out all the great resources and materials and articles they have on that site thanks again judy Thank you, George. It was my pleasure. And until next time, keep fighting the good fight because we are all in this together. 
before I go, quick announcement. I've been asked by so many people over the past couple of years about how do I start a podcast that I've developed and released a course that will teach you exactly how to do that step by step from figuring out the kind of show that you want to have to understanding how all the technology works behind it and then how to get great guests and uh, keep the thing moving and how to grow it. So if you're interested in that, check it out. You can go to georgegrombacher.com forward slash podcast course and you'll find it there. You can just go to the website. I'll also list that in the notes of the show. What's up, Savage Nation? Please support the show by subscribing, leave us a review, and definitely feel free to share us with somebody you think would like it. Come on.